Roll for Crit is made possible thanks to the support of viewers like you and our patrons on our Patreon page. You can become a patron for just $1 a month at patreon.com slash roll for crit. A wild Kickstarter has appeared. It's time to see if it's worth adding to your collection for the week of November 16th, 2020. Harry Potter is back on Kickstarter in a big way with Harry Potter Catch the Snitch from Night Games. This is an adaptation of the game of Quidditch from the Wizarding World of Harry Potter. There are two players in this game. Each one takes the role of a coach of a different Quidditch team. One of the four houses from Hogwarts traditionally, though there's an expansion uh, that I think you can add in more professional players if you'd like. And there are two phases of the game. In the first one, you are moving the different players around your field, trying to score goals, rolling dice to do so, passing the ball to each other, etc. And then in the second phase, you are trying to get the snitch itself. And based on how well you did in that first phase, you will have gotten more snitch cards and you're gonna be using those with their different effects uh, to try and be the first person to score that snitch and end the game. You're also going to have uh, fan cards or spectator cards, I think they're called. So depending on who is watching you, they could have an impact. So you'll be able to bring in other characters from the Harry Potter world that aren't strictly Quidditch players. And you'll have all kinds of other cards to play, different effects, you'll be able to stun your opponents, it's etc. This is an interesting one. It was This was actually on Kickstarter a few weeks ago. They canceled it or delayed it uh, just because I think of the election and everything. They, they wanted to get more press and everybody was a little preoccupied at that <laughs> time. But it's back now and it's being very well funded at this point. And Quidditch is... Traditionally, I think seen as kind of a traditionally. I don't know what I'm saying, but <laughs> we're old uh, enough. It's tradition. Now. <laughs> it's like a kind of a broken game in many ways. It, it it really doesn't make sense outside of the context of the crazy, wacky world of Harry Potter. But it sounds like this game, in an interesting way, is almost fixing some of those aspects of it. In that it used to be, you know, the snitch is worth so many points in the books that it really was just like, well, why do you even have points? The snitch is the end of the game. Well, they just embraced that and said, yeah, the goal now is just to get the snitch. And everything that you do uh, in terms of scoring goals or you know all that stuff in the other part of the game is in service of getting the snitch, which kind of makes it seem like it makes more sense. And there's stuff where you can customize your teams, change, change out different players and things like that. Uh, I don't know. It look, looks kind of cool. It's also, of course, got a lot of minis of all the different characters. So this is this is a, a big one, definitely geared towards more of the hardcore Harry Potter fan. I yeah, I'm trying to remember the rules, but I do I do recall that it was sort of the uh, I think partly just to make because you, your protagonist then gets the snitch. It sort of makes them always the the spotlight character. So it right. does sound like that is one way you could fix the game is making it literally that's all you care about. Instead of changing the point values, I'm sure there maybe there are different rules of Quidditch, like Scottish Quidditch or something, you know, where <laughs> people have adjusted it to be like the Quidditch is only worth 50. It's a good bonus, but maybe something like that. I don't know. Yeah, yeah, I don't know either. Could could be could be something like that out there, but uh, this is how they've decided to tackle it in this version of the game. There was another Quidditch board game that I think like when the books early on were coming out, but I don't think it's in print anymore and it probably wasn't that good. I don't know. <laughs> this one definitely is uh, a bigger product. You can get this for around $101 USD. Uh, so it's it's a big ask and it comes with, again, like a ton of different minis for every individual character. So if you're a big fan, uh, you'll have a really nice setup. You'll get to see these characters represented on the table like never before, perhaps. Benders from Game Brewer is a game that's all about time travel with, as you can probably guess the name, bending the rules of time and space. In this game, the objective is to have the most chips, aka victory points. However, as the game progresses, rules are going to shift around, which may change how you gain some of those points or versus how you spend the points or other resources to activate abilities. The way the game actually works is there is a outer ring, which are in essence the rules of the game, and an inner ring, which will be actually made of different modules that you will decide what to use. They'll have a theme like dinosaurs or pirates, which of course have their own mechanics, whether you want a more aggressive game or maybe a game that focuses more on resource or drawing management. You will choose four of those different modules have 
as well as a center board that you always use that has these flex cards. And during the game, you'll be drawing cards from these decks. And depending on the, all the rules on the outside, you may involve which ones you're allowed to play, which ones you're allowed to draw, how big your hand size is. Now, you'll get mainly three resources. There's the chips I mentioned earlier. Those are your victory points. There are cubes, which I'll get to a little bit later, and of course, the cards you draw. Cards have a cost to play them. One of the rules, of course, will tell you what resource you need to play cards. It could be other cards, could be those cubes, could be your own chips. Now, when you play these cards, they have different effects. Sometimes they're just well, disappear at the end of the round. Some of them will last the entire game. Some will even adjust in value depending on what round you're playing in. And of course, you may want to not play certain cards. You may want more cards. You want to maybe use different resources. That's where that outer rim goes and those cubes come in. On your turn, if you don't play a card, you could also place a cube. You'll place cubes in these little trays in each area on the outer rim. And at the end of the round, whoever has the most cubes there gets to change the rules. First, they'll change the general rule, which may be like draw five cards a turn, maybe only four cards. Then you'll shift your own personal piece that's on an upper separate track, this evolutionary track, which gives you a bonus to that. So for example, going back to the draw, you can either make it so you draw an extra card or maybe draw a, one less card. The reason why you go towards the negative side is there's chips at the end of each of these tracks. And at the end of the game, whoever's closest gets bonus chips. As you can guess, being on the negative side means you're probably gonna get a higher bonus. So it's all about this weird game of not only choosing which modules and rules and decks you're going to play with, but bidding over to how you change the rules and be like, yeah, I want to make sure we have to spend chips because I have a whole chip engine going in, uh, in order to play cards. Or maybe, no, I want to make sure I draw a lot of cards or something, or we don't want to play a lot of cards because you have a really easy way to play cards. It really was, I feel like, looking at this, I want to play Flux, but much less random and more of a like jet, like medium to higher weight game rules in there which is like really crazy for me <laughs> yeah um i mean i think the concept is really great i i love the idea of mixing different forget forget about rules just different genres is a lot of fun well, you know you have sci-fi and fantasy and all these things coming together in one concept and like you said it sounds like they found a way to make it so rather than it just being a crazy party game of now this rules in play now that rules in play now this is happening and this is happening it sounds more cohesive than that and like a yes a exactly kind of experience uh, mm -hmm. the game flux bringing up again one of my favorite things isn't winning i actually find that really annoying to find whatever two items you need it's the other stuff because i feel it's really interesting when the game rules change to be like all right now i draw three now but if i play this card i can play four and like does some weird stuff this takes that without the randomness because now it's like okay i really want to be able to draw these cards and i don't like the pirate cards so i'm going to make it so you can't play pirate cards this round that's one of the things too you can't just play any card so it, there is much more strategy with the rule shifting around. So you still get the fun mm -hmm. of really trying to break the game, so to speak, in the way that works best for you versus your opponents without feeling like it's just some chaotic mess where you just randomly throw things down. Right. And the theme mechanic, not the theme mechanic, the uh, module mechanic in the center, I really love that as well too because then you could make, a, let's say if you have a much more aggressive play group, yeah, we're going to throw in the sets and themes that are also much more aggressive and attacking. But if you don't, it's easy to swap that out. Plus, the center having the flux ability, not flux, wow, the flex cards uh, that uh, pretty much anyone can use and stuff. It means there's always a, somewhat of a constant for cards-wise to be used. And they really look more about the outer ring, too. So they'll, like, reward you if you're farther or lower on a certain track, which adds even more strategy to the kinds of rules you're going to change. Right now, as of this Kickstarter, it's still in the early bird area. So if you're be quick enough, depending on when we upload this video, it still might be around, if you're new to backing their games, around $65. It might be a little bit more by the time you're watching this, but I'm assuming it's gonna be around that price for their standard Electron Edition. My next pick is called Square One from a company called Wizama. And this is not a game, although it is a way to allow you to play different games. It is a gaming console for board games, a tablet which features a touch screen and other devices to read components that you are going to be placing on top of it. So it is compatible with multiple games that you will be 
purchasing through this device and downloading onto it, just like you would a video game. And then you can use physical components, pieces, dice, cards, and depending on how you place those and whatever the rules of the game are, the device will read them, understand what you have done, and react to it. So each game is going to have its own set of uh, sound effects, visual effects, background music, as well as in-game tutorials, and other things that are meant to make this an easier, more streamlined experience, bringing some of that technological aspect into the traditional board gaming world. This is not the first time we have seen a company try to introduce a device similar to this. Uh, there have been one, at least one or two in the past on Kickstarter, but uh, I don't think any of them have either fully come to fruition yet, they haven't uh, hit the market in a big way, or they just haven't caught on in a big way. This one, I think, stands out a little bit to me in that uh, it's from a company and they are going to have their own unique games designed for it, but they are also adapting a couple of uh, standard tabletop games to it uh, that people are more familiar with now. Two of the ones I saw mentioned on the page in particular, or I'll mention three. One was Not Alone, uh, one, another one is The Crew, and also Cthulhu Wars. All three of those are getting adaptations, digital versions uh, produced by the original designers and publishers for this method of play. So it's not just whatever's in their particular ecosystem or from their company or what have you. I think there's some really cool ideas here. I love a lot of the concepts of adding this tech to board games. Uh, I, it remains to be seen how successful it's going to be, and I'm not sure which company is going to be the one to do it, but I do think that one of these eventually in the next five to ten years will catch on. I, I, I hope so, because I think after this current time period, we've seen that we really need to increase our ability to game with each other from separate locations. Uh, how mm. big is this? The... the tablet board i don't know how to <laughs> yeah flow. it's not huge it's i don't know the exact dimensions it's not like table sized it's right it's like the size of like a few ipads together maybe right. <laughs> i only ask because you mentioned cthulhu wars and i know how much table space that can take <laughs> yeah i mean i assume it just zooms out you know that, i mean that's, uh, i hope so, yeah, i don't know how the minis work with it too but yeah, I mean, it's it's cool stuff. I'm excited to see how they do it. And, you know, the, it does allow you to play remotely. I assume that's if the other players also have the device, but that is something towards what you're mentioning. Now, it's pretty pricey. This edition of it, if you go through this Kickstarter, uh, is around $592 US. So I don't know if this is going to be more towards, you know, super early adopters who are really interested in tech and or maybe also there's a developer's kit for people who want to try to use this to make their own games. But if it's successful, maybe we'll see something in the future where it gets cheaper and something like this may become more common. It's time to get cozy with our next pick, which is Creature Comforts. In this game, you're all woodland creatures who have just woken up from a long winter, but that means it's time to get ready for the next winter. The goal of this game is to make the coziest, most comfortable home for you to stay in during the winter. You're going to be going around the village and forest, gathering resources, building different recipes, to either upgrade your home or maybe just make some nice items like some nice warm socks. And of course, meeting with travelers who will come throughout the village and maybe give you some good ideas. The way the game works is you're going to roll dice and each space has its own requirements, like two dice at the same value, three dice of increasing value, so on and so forth. And you'll have two dice to work with, but there'll also be a communal village pool that you'll roll dice for. You'll all have your own workers, and from what I can tell, there isn't a first-come, first-serve, or only one worker can share a space. You all sort of are doing your own thing, just trying to maximize your points. Honestly, I chose this because I almost need this more comforting kind of game where it's just like, just make something lovely. <laughs> it's one. It seems to be not aggressive at all, and really is like, I feel even if you didn't win, you're like, well... I still made this nice quilt and I got these socks and I like, that's the kind of thing I sort of want to do right now. <laughs> yeah. It's very, very cute. I, I, I agree with you. I love the theme. It just, who doesn't want to cozy up for the winter in a cabin by the fire, that sort of thing. And uh, the, you know, the way the worker placement works, but it's like you said, you're not competing uh, for first come first serve. It's just about your own dice uh, it just seems like a, a friendlier sort of a game. It reminds me of Everdell a little bit too in the in the look and style of it. I do want to mention, by the way, that the order that all this stuff happens will matter, or at least making it more 
gamey. You roll your own dice first, so you see what number you have. You place your workers, then you roll what the village community dice are. So you won't be guaranteed to know if you'll have a second four there for you to use. And the spaces do change with the seasons, just like Everdell. So you will never know what, I mean, you won't have the exact same plans and strategies each round because the same spaces won't be around. For $38, you can add this game to your collection, and I'm pretty sure this will make your home a little bit more comfortable. Questlings is a new line of RPG books for kids. This is a campaign for two different types of books. The first is a series of storybooks, the first one being So You Want to Be a Paladin. And these are picture books for kids that are based around the idea of fantasy and role playing and uh, being a kid, but also being some kind of a fantastical hero with great abilities. And then alongside that, there is also an actual role playing game here that is called Questlings. And this one is for kids eight and up, assuming they have one adult to run it as their GM. And it is a simplified type of role playing experience wherein kids have their own kid character as well as their own hero character. And during the game, they'll be going back and forth between them. You have a cute little map that you're traveling around on. Each turn, one player will get the spotlight, as they put it, and they will decide where you want where they want to go, uh, how they're going to roll their dice, what happens to them, how they feel about it. Something to introduce them to the basics of role playing without being super punishing or super hardcore in terms of the amount of rules. This is a really cute idea, I think. I mean, there's something very fun for kids. There's definitely been other role-playing games geared towards kids and other role-playing games that you can modify to allow kids to play, but I think it's definitely a space that there's more room to explore in and just, you know, there's something about these role-playing games that is kind of childlike in a lot of ways. You're using your imagination, you're you're making up stories, and I think it's a lot of fun to see something like this that will bring kids into it and allow them to adapt to it easily without overwhelming them. I really love the idea of the uh, kid and adult version. I think that actually is something that will be interesting for a lot of people, regardless of age. The book, I think, is adorable, but I imagine it getting darker as you go on until you get like, so you want to be a warlock. Do you remember the paladin being all nice? Mm, we're going to throw out some of those rules. <laughs> hey, there can be some some good, lawful good warlocks. <laughs> you, you could make that happen. Uh, but yeah, it, it is very cute. Uh, it These are developed and put together by Banana Chan and Tim Devine, who have worked on other role-playing games and board games in the past that you're probably familiar with. So take a look at the page. You can get uh, both books digitally for $10 or just one physically and the other digitally for 15 or both together as physical copies plus the eBooks for $29. Hopefully you're not too hungry right now because our next pick will definitely make your tummy rumble and that's Hibachi. This game is actually sort of a re-implementation of an older game titled San Franito. I'm probably mispronouncing that, but it is a dexterity bidding game, so to speak. In this game, there will be ingredients on the board as well as some special spaces. You will be throwing tiles onto the board face down, trying to cover up these spaces. Now on the other side of your tiles will have a number value. And if you have the highest value, you obviously win the space. But for ingredients, for example, let's say that you had the 400 and 100 tile versus your opponent's 200 tile, you won it, but you have to then pay what your total is. So in that case, that would be 500 for each ingredient you want. Now, however, you will then remove a tile and it gets cheaper as the thing goes on, but there are very little number of supply of ingredients each round. So that just because you have to pay, you get to still pay a lower cost, doesn't mean you're guaranteed to get it. Of course, those special spaces will mix things up by adding an extra tile, becoming the first player or the head chef. And you will be using those ingredients to actually cook up recipes. The first one who actually gets to cook up three recipes wins. This is very interesting to me because dexterity games, I usually just think, oh, it's fun throwing things. But that bidding element, and yes, you can knock other people's discs. You wait until everyone throws their discs. So if you know you want to win that for a lower cost, maybe instead of trying to throw two discs there, you want to knock off an opponent's disc so they don't have any presence there. It's very <laughs> weird combination of these sort of mechanics. <laughs> yeah, I think it's cool. I mean, I think there's definitely more room for dexterity games to 
uh, be more than just party games, but you know, inevitably they're always going to have some element of that just because it's goofy to be throwing things around the room. And there's, uh, you know, depending on different players, ability levels and things, you can't guarantee like strategic balance really Mm. in that kind of a game. Uh, but I think as an aspect of it, and if you add other ingredients to the mix, uh, there's something interesting that you could come up with there. So I'm all, I'm in for it. And I like grail games too. So I I think this one looked good. Yeah, pretty solid. Uh, my biggest issue with it right now is now I'm really hungry for some hibachi. (laughs) Now, if you want to get this game, you only need to pay $31. You no need to drive out and visit your local hibachi store. One more advanced pick for you is a game called Reality Shift. This is launching Thursday of this week, uh, the day after this video goes up. It's from Academy Games, and it's a racing game that involves 3D cubes that shift around the board, sort of Tron-like. We're going to have our own full in-depth preview video for that one later on, so look for that on our channel for more details. And another one that is up there right now is Knights of the Hound Table Sales and Tales. This is an expansion for a game that we also did a preview for a while back now. It's a cute little little competitive card game where you have dogs and each turn you pick different dogs from your hand that have different abilities and try to trick your opponent by how you play them and where you play them. And in our original preview, we did ask them, uh, specifically you did, Will, that they, mm-hmm. they needed to add more corgis to the game and they did listen to you. And this expansion has a new set of corgis as well as huskies and some other dogs too. That is so great. And who doesn't love dogs? I mean, <laughs> yeah, who doesn't who doesn't love great. dogs? But I, I got to say this week, definitely, we there are a lot of great picks out there. So we, we can only fit so many in this video. So if there's one that you felt that we did not give justice to, let us know in the comments down below. We'll, of course, look at that. And of course, anyone else will be able to see them and check them out themselves. But until then, I'm Will. I'm Jonathan. And this has been Kickstarter Pickstarter. Catch the latest from Roll for Crit by liking and subscribing. And don't forget to support us on Patreon. Don't get analysis paralysis. Just click those buttons. Help us out.